As the flames die down, he has a profound sense of peace and acceptance, knowledge that the desire for domination comes from pain, from not feeling good enough. The snake eats its own tail, the beast spirals down into the darkness, and Malcolm rises up to where the air is sweet. He breathes in starlight and feels the enoughness of his soul radiate out into the universe. When he exits the dream, he is speechless, even in his mind. Well played, at bottom boy Beijing, 164 subconscious mind. Well played. It was nothing like he expected. It wasn't sassy or cool, but it was almost religious in its intensity. He rates it five out of five. He orders himself some pad thai. He writes another letter to Lutando. Sure. <laughs> so good morning, sentient beings. Um, <laughs> it's really wonderful to have you joining us. My name is Kevil Hiri, as I said, and I'm the executive director of the Gala Queer Archive based in Johannesburg. And I'm thrilled to be sitting with you in conversation. Uh, novelist Alist Alistair McKay about his debut novel, It Doesn't Have to Be This Way. Now, I'm not going to share with you Alistair's bio in the book because that's more motivation for you to buy the book. <laughs> but what I'd like to do is slightly different, and that's to share with you my experience of Alistair, given that we are friends for many years. So we started out as Chomis in Cape Town, and he may not remember this, but I, um, I remember one of my first encounters with him, which was at the launch of a gala exhibition at the Jewish Museum, which was on the persecution of gay men in Nazi Germany. And um, what really struck me with Alistair was when the official kind of program had started and there were speeches and stuff, he uh, whooped out his little notebook <laughs> and, and pencil and was taking notes, which I thought was like just so, so studious and like <laughs> thoughtful. Um, and uh, we were part of this WhatsApp group called the Socially Conscious Gays of Cape Town. And yes, we can all agree that's a little cringy now. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe that what like, bound us in this group was one, our gayness, two, our love for this country, and three, our intentions of being humans, mindful of the inequalities that we witnessed around us, and um, you know, the ways in which we could really challenge and support each other to be better humans. And I don't think that's like better humans in the way Melania Trump thinks about it, but like, <laughs> you know, kind of more complex than that and understanding that it's really difficult, it's a really difficult existence in this world, particularly when we're facing all of these things and how do we then show up in different ways that, that mean something. And it was throughout that experience that I, um, you know, experienced Alistair as a really passionate writer who was thoughtful, meticulous, um, eager, immensely kind, charming, gregarious, sensitive, and uh, I hesitate to say this, actually no I don't, because I say this with the greatest amount of reverence, great bottom energy. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And um, I, um, sorry, I'm getting a little lost here, um, and I think his debut novel really encapsulates a lot of these wonderful qualities. Um, and throughout my personal journey of reading, it doesn't have to be this way. It really filled me up with this warm sense of, and the only word that I can think of uh, is this Yiddish word of nachos. So my friend, I want to start off by saying congratulations um, and on this remarkable achievement. And I know that so much of your life's calling is about writing, and so well no. done on achieving that. And for putting Thank so you. much of yourself into the story, which I believe First and foremost is a story of African queer love. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for that. What a beautiful intro, Kill. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, and one of the things uh, I, I, I wanted to start off with, uh, particularly thinking about your journey as a writer, is mm -hmm. why this story in this moment? Um, Jeez, I mean, I guess I feel like the world is feeling pretty dystopian uh, these days ever since, well, not ever since Trump, I guess it started before that, recessions and all of that, you know, like our generation grew up feeling so optimistic, mm -hmm. thinking, you know, the world's problems are all behind us, we're going to put racism to bed, we're going to decolonize the country. Um, and I guess the last 10 years or so have just felt like, like a lot of social progress has been sliding backwards. Um, so I guess I've wanted to write this dystopia for a long time and, and the climate crisis really freaks me out. Uh, so I studied politics in undergrad and I was reading about, you know, the, the climate projections back then and wondering why is this not um, front page news every day because, you know, it's very hellish, the, the, some of these scenarios. Um, 
And then I lived overseas for a few years, and when I came back, it sort of struck me with fresh eyes, like the dystopian levels of inequality in this country. Because you kind of, you almost acclimatize to it when, when you're here all the time, you know, and then you, you leave and you come back and you're like, Jesus, this is not normal. What we think of as normal is really not normal. Um, and there's this thing, there's this saying about uh, dystopian literature that it's only dystopian when it's happening to us rather than to them, you know. Mm. So I guess there's this idea that I wanted to explore some of the social dynamics of South Africa through the lens of a dystopia. But a lot of these issues are already, already happening, you know, it's not some future trouble that's, that's coming down the line. And in terms of the queer story, I guess I just don't feel like there's enough of them. Like, I feel like it's important to have more, more queer stories, more queer African stories, to show queer love, as you say, to celebrate it, but also show some of the complexities within it. Um, yeah, I guess that's why I, ne <laughs> I needed to write this. And I've been kind of obsessed with trying to write this book. I've been trying to write it for so many years. And, and along the way, you know, you get disheartened and people say to me, why don't you try something else, try and write another novel? I'm like, no, I cannot let this go until it's done. And now that it's done, now I'm able to write other stuff. But like, I needed to get this out into the world for some reason. So. <laughs> sure. I, I mean, I like the idea of you, because I think also when I was reading the book, thinking about the dystopia which is out there, and then sometimes it was, I, I had to put it down because all of it felt so real. I know mm. we spoke yesterday about like, you know, when you spoke about the KZN floods, it felt so prescient because I was like, this is, I'm reading this book as yeah. this is happening in real time. Mm. And so, you know, that, that, that I, I, I kind of get that. Um, and I think one of the things that I noticed about your writing, which I really enjoyed uh, about the novel, was the amount of, like, work slash work <laughs> that you had done. And the bits of attention to detail, I, I kept remembering one of my other favorite authors, Kieran Desai, who, like, describes things that you didn't really know that you wanted described, but you appreciated once once it was done because it kind of like gave you a better sense of I don't know the setting, um, and it's great that it's a South African like novel. Mm. And, you know, reminding myself of those kind of things. Um, but the one thing I wanted to chat to you about was like you know even this uh, description uh, of like a kind of camp campy pulp fiction meets Paris is burning thing, <laughs> yeah. which um, I immediately kind of in my mind knew exactly what you were talking about. And it was dorky and like beautiful <laughs> and like really sweet, you know. And so I really enjoyed these like moments of like, uh, I suppose, queer joy that, that you yeah. speak about. Um, and earlier I referred to your, your book as a queer African story. And I was a little sneaky in doing that because I want to bring in the fact that you wrote a short story or contributed to the gala's anthology of queer africa 2 which was going home and that was also a gay love story maybe not love but it was it was it was yeah it was it was about two men and this complex relationship and in many ways i i it wasn't an easy read either because mm -hmm. you seem very interested in portraying the complexities of race mm -hmm. shame um violence sex mm -hmm. and the beauty within these relationships and I think the same applies to your portrayal of the heartbreaking love story between Lutando and Viwe. Why is it important to you? Um, oh God, I don't know. <laughs> I suppose partially to process my own stuff. I guess all writers are trying to process mm. their own trauma and um, things that they've been through. And I think a lot of queer people, hopefully less so nowadays, but like we grow up with a lot of shame and feeling like we're evil or, or yeah, that the people that we want to love will hate us for loving them. So, yeah, there's a way of trying to process that and try to heal that part of myself, maybe. And, um, and I also think that that shame does really interesting thing. Well, interesting, I mean, that sounds quite like disinterested and like clinical, but I think it plays out in really strange and unexpected ways in, in some gay relationships where there's kind of this like dominating impulse or so I think the character in that going home story is mm. is even more problematic than viewer uh, yeah. viewer has his issues <laughs> which we'll talk about in a second um, but he's like so he's a he's a he's a white gay guy and he's uh, quite clueless in terms of his privilege and how he's almost using this other person of color who he, so he thinks he's healing himself but he's actually inflicting so much damage and there's this there's a similar dynamic that plays out with Viwe where he's trying to he's sort of trying to fight his own demons and trying mm -hmm. to fight like how much damage toxic masculinity has done to him by trying to sort of prove that he is a man and prove that he's not all the things that people have always said about him but then that sort of hatred that he's internalized spills out into the rest of the world and it causes so much damage to other people as well, you know, and this, this sort of culture sort of perpetuates itself of people harming others to try and heal something in themselves because they were harmed in a similar way. I don't know, I, I find that very 
compelling and hard to look away from and I wish we could heal it and sort of break the chain you know sure yeah I, I hear what you're saying and I think that's what really endeared me to the character of Lutando in a way because mm. um, there's such a softness to him and he takes such pride in that softness yeah. you know and, and then often thinking about the way in which we read describes him or sees him mm. and I think there's like a, a bit of like admiration but also resentment and mm. then also like yeah but he's so gay you know yeah. um, and, and yeah I think that I think that is a very like complex you know kind of existence really yeah absolutely and it's totally yeah it's not black and white because they do also really love each other and there are these mm. moments of tenderness and joy as you mentioned which I wanted to also like dwell in and, and so that you can feel how much they care for each other but there's this stuff going on inside him that he can't, he kind of can't accept that he loves someone who's not only gay, but also quite femme. Yeah. 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 I'm going to get to Vive in a second. Okay. Um, and I know you've been asked um, questions around your decision as a writer to choose protagonists in the story who are gay black men. And I'm mm -hmm. happy for you to share your thoughts on, on this with us. But I'm kind of more interested in the, the really, um, the, the dynamic between the three protagonists. So, um, there's Lutando, who is, as I mentioned, I think very like proud and out, and mm. and, and, and it feels almost comfortable in his skin, mm. which is, which I think was such an important, such an important like character to, to yeah. be, you know, yeah. um, particularly as we deal with violence and, and the continuing violence against queer bodies. And then there's Viwe, who's the masculine, uncomfortable in his body, um, and yet exudes this kind of like. You know, like rugby jock energy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like I've got my shit together. Mm. Okay. Actually, if inside everything's like mm. crumbling in mm. a way. Mm. And then there's Malcolm, who I wrote to as like hot ginger but timid gay. <laughs> <laughs> that sums him up. <laughs> I mean, it does sum him up. Um, and particularly in the South African context, we know that the divides of race mm. and class means that our queer experiences mm. of existence are wildly different yeah. and how did you think about that when you were creating these separate characters yeah it's 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 a mess as you say like there's so much going on with with different with different experiences and there's a little bit of myself in all of the characters so mm. i think i sort of almost started with that and i was like there are these sort of these sort of these three impulses within myself and how I, how I deal with feeling overwhelmed and feeling anxious and feeling afraid for where the world is heading. Um, and then I sort of tried to split them out into three distinct characters. And once I realized that, that two of them uh, needed to be black men because of, we can talk about that in a second, but because of like all the other social uh, things that happen in this book. Yeah, I th I then I guess I just tried to inhabit that mentality and you know read a lot of black writers and, and talk to people and try and get into the mind space of those characters so that I could feel what it's like to be them because I think I think writing fiction is all about empathy so you've mm -hmm. got to be able to imagine yourself in some well not yourself but imagine what it's like to go through a kind of life that you're writing and really inhabit that and you know fill it out and show the full human behind it I think the problem comes with writing people who are a different race from your own is when it's like very flat or the characters are sort of one-dimensional you know um, so I've tried really hard not to do that and I guess the readers can tell me if I've done a good job or not. But um, yeah, I think there's a lot going on in terms of the queerness and how it intersects with race in this country. Because even as a white gay man, I, you know, you do struggle a lot growing up. And there's all this stuff about telling you you're not good enough and you're wrong. But then there's just so much additional stuff. And, he, and Malcolm has so much more privilege than the other two characters, you know. And, and he's sort of able to live his life the way he wants to live his life and he can opt in and opt out of the struggles mm. which the other two can't opt in and can't uh, out of um yeah sorry i don't know if that answers your no, question no that, yeah. that really does mm -hmm. um and and the one thing that i wanted to pick up on which i which i which I, you know when you're speaking about how does one write about characters because i think writers should have the license to write about any characters that mm. they feel about mm. and i think empathy is is really important but also um what I what I had a deep sense about, which is why I also s um, why it was a kind of challenging read, was that none of the characters are heroes and none of the mm. characters are villains. You know, mm. they all mm. have their demons. Mm. Even Lutando, in some way, I was like, you know, is this like person who's like very headstrong and doesn't think twice about like you know a storming the ESCOM thing and uh, you know and the, and the violence that could be inflicted on like yeah. let's say the potentially like, security guards or whoever's in the you know mm. and so and I think that. We often carry those risks as humans because that's who we are. We're very complex and sometimes 
mean well, but you know, yeah, um, yeah, we don't know, often have control over the anger and resentment that we feel, and those mm. play out in in really different ways. Um, I think I struggled most with Malcolm's character, okay, particularly because of he's a he's he's privileged mm. in like stepping in and stepping out, mm. trying to show care, but not. Um, um, you know, not, a, not if it comes at like a huge cost to him. Yeah, no, totally. He can definitely be quite cowardly. Like if he gets frightened, he just pulls back, you know. But with all of them, as you say, I wanted them to be complex. I didn't want anyone to be a simple hero or, or villain or whatever. So I hope that like, I sort of fell in love with these characters while I was writing the book. Mm -hmm. And I hope that the reader does too, because they, even as you see them doing terrible things and, you, mm. and you're like, no, uh, why, why are you acting this way? I also hope that sort of you can feel why they're doing it and you know th the damage that's caused these decisions or, yeah, it's, it's hard to, well, I think that's, uh, human beings are messy, you know, we're not, we're not yeah, one yeah, thing yeah. or the other. So I was trying to put some of that messiness into them yeah. so that they're not sort of flat queer characters, they're not like a type, you know, I didn't want to write types. Yeah, um, yeah, I, 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 I had a huge sense of that actually. But, and um, kind of uh, following from this, I, because speaking about the complexity and like not the neatness, um, I kind of was wondering also why all this violence was necessary. <laughs> and I want to give you some context to that. Um, you know, over the past two years, um, you know, the world has gone through the most, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, we now sit with this war that's happening. And um, last year in South Africa alone, there was the murder or hate crimes of 26 queer individuals mm. all across the country. Mm. And often there's this argument about, um, you know, the gays are free now. We have mm. this amazing constitution and these laws that allow mm. us. And in, mm. in a way, there is a freedom in, in, mm. in the way in which Malcolm and Natando and Biwe exist. Um, but the, the, the unexpected turn, which I think I spoke to you about, like I, and I'm not going to give too much away about the, the, the story, but like, the violence, particularly in in in, in at, at the end of like, uh, or at least the unfathomable cruelty in some way that that yeah. Viwe is able to exert on on this person that he loves and cares for and tries to redeem himself in some way. Yeah. Um, was that necessary? I think it was, but I'd be interested to know why it had to take that kind of dark turn in a way. <laughs> Uh, yeah, things get very dark. I, I was I was upsetting myself a lot when I was writing this book. <laughs> it's quite traumatic to write this book. Um, I think it was necessary. So so one of the things that I wanted to look at was kind of, so obviously there's a dystopia and it goes from the present day into uh, 15 years into the future. And the premise is that climate change uh, gets out of control, you know, and, and sort of Cape Town is, is basically destroyed. There's no water. It's unbearably hot. Uh, there's nothing grows. There's no food. So. Um, I think that's quite a frightening scenario. And I think I've observed in the last few years that like often when people feel afraid, it leads to more extremism, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I think like Trump's America is an example of that. Like people felt like, oh, what's happening to our country? And then they become very conservative. And, and then it's always the marginalized who pay the price of that. So whether it's immigrants, you know, there's like xenophobic attacks uh, in, in South Africa, or, or whether it's queer people, whether it's women. Um, yeah, it's kind of, well, it's, it's never the straight white guys who, who suffer the brunt of this stuff. Um, and I think part of why Viewer's journey is so dark is it's also got a, it's got a kind of religious under, mm. undertone to it. So he grows up in a very religious home, and, I, and I've dated people who've been very, very damaged by that. Um, and I kind of wanted to show, there's almost like a... I don't know, almost like a middle finger to society to say like so much damage is inflicted on queer people and it's usually internalized, you know, it's usually like expresses itself as self-harm or even suicide sometimes. And so I almost wanted Viewer to turn it outwards onto the world again. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a very problematic journey for him. Like I'm not saying it's, it's good what happens and he does do terrible things to the people that he loves. But it's almost, it's a way of showing in like real time and like through physical acts what's, what's often going on inside people, you know? Um, uh, and, that, and that struggle with shame and acceptance. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, in that sense, what I really enjoyed was also the counter that Rutando and Napolo are in relation mm. to Vive because mm. he's driven to these acts of cruelty 
by his debilitating shame and this like self-loathing mm -hmm. which comes from from religion and we know that and boarding school let's not forget boarding, boarding school's school, role yes <laughs> and boarding school <laughs> and let's not forget that in the current context it's very real i mean mm. religious leaders use their mm. pulpits to spread hatred all the time mm. which affects the parents of queer people to the point of like throwing your own child out of their home you know yeah. which for me i just I, i cannot fathom that level of like mm cruelty that you mm. could you could do unto your own and i believe that the 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 kind of grace and and love that the tando and nicola both show towards viwe mm. even in those intolerable moments of mm. cruelty um gives offers him some kind of redemption you know um, yeah. and and in his his kind of legacy um you know and how they honor that um and like what of their justice and redemption i mean do you think that that was that's how they they acted it out in a way that you know it's it's kind of what saved them yeah i suppose i suppose lutando as you say he sort of he he also struggles i mean no one has an easy time in this book but he is able to find his way back to himself and to find his authentic you know maybe he has a bit of a wobbly but he goes back to his authenticity and he is kind of all about love and he is a such a supportive loving person and he mm. the fact that he is able i don't know i think the fact that he's able to retain that through through the horrors that he's put through is quite redemptive you know i think it's he's a really hopeful character in my mind like the most aspirational i guess the one that he i would like is. to be the most like yeah. him you know yeah. um and otkolo as well she's um she's also very kind in like quite she's 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 strong as she has to be in this in this setup but she's also yeah she's very kind kind to be with and i i don't want to say they give him more kindness than he deserves because he's also going through a lot but yeah they are they very they're very good to him i think in like surprising ways and i think i wanted to show again because i think one of the themes that runs through this book is like disconnection and loneliness mm -hmm. and feeling kind of isolated from one another so I, i wanted these moments of like really powerful love and powerful community and looking after each other you know against kind of against all odds yeah there's that um there's a scene in the book where um you know they're in the in the house uh, or the flat in Friedrichshafen and they're all kind of like laughing and things are a little bit tense but whatever, whatever but there is this like sense of of community in a sense mm. you know people mm. and then you know the kind of disruption that that continuously that continuously happens and it kind of reminded me a lot of like thinking about covid you know where yeah. like there were these moments where you saw friends and like were able to engage and then that mm. that just that fear that we all which i don't i think it's going to take us like years to get over that like trauma of like knowing that yeah. things outside are just not within our control or like yeah completely out of yeah. our control you know and then these moments that we could kind of show um or share queer joy in a way was so makes it even more kind of like important you know yeah yeah absolutely um I know I spoke about the kind of prescience of the Kaiser and Flals and um we 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 chatted a little bit yesterday and I I had asked you whether you thought this book was was kind of like a sci-fi thriller I didn't think it was as I said I think it's primarily about like queer love um but maybe I'm biased also seeing <laughs> in the like mind of the Gala queer archive and why these queer stories are important but um climate change does play a really or at least your your observations about climate and how mm. we're really like fucking up this world mm. um play a huge role but and it's interesting to then think about queerness within that context um mm. what do you think are the kind of like things that join these seemingly disparate of you know disparate like kind of topics of yeah if you talk about climate change you can't talk about like queer violence in a way which yeah. is No and and it's that's a really good question because I think I think some people are surprised like the of the two sort of main themes in this book because it seems like a strange hybrid. <laughs> uh but I guess one of the things I wanted to explore in it that I that I sort of believe I suppose is is that they're not a hybrid they're kind of the expression of the same thing you know like this capitalism and colonialism and racism and homophobia they're all violence perpetuated against us you know and they're all kind of part of the same system the same the same like mentality that's tearing down the rainforests and and burning all the fossil fuels is like making people hate each other and not believe they're good enough and need to produce um yeah they're kind of very linked in my head so i don't know if i'm able to express that clearly <laughs> in the book but it's it's like a whole system system that needs to to shift a whole kind of ideology around 
I guess it does come from like colonial capitalism um, with all of its kind of nasty uh, homophobic elements as well. You know, there's a lot of violence perpetuated against people um, and against the planet. And I guess that excerpt that I was reading earlier is kind of trying to hint at the fact that I feel like if we could undo some of the psychological damage behind the system that's driving, you know, the destruction of the planet, we would also be so much better to each other and more at peace. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and, and I think um, that's why I think one, having more queer voices in mm. storytelling is so mm. important. Mm. Um, you know, even drawing on our experience during um, COVID and the work that, that, that Gala was trying to do where, um, you know, whilst mm. the government was saying, stay at home, that's mm. the safest place to be. Mm. We knew that for many in our community, that was not the case. Mm. Um, and, and so the way with this global pandemic affected particularly queer lives mm. um, needed a, 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 an understanding of like what, what it is to create home. What does that, yes. that mean? And so trying to then find these links, particularly in mm. this world where like one capitalism mm. ruins everything. <laughs> yeah. I think we can agree to that. And, and then finding the ways in which we can really create um, community because we are yeah. dealing with all of these um, challenges uh, that, that are hitting us all, all at once. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And also I think that maybe that's another reason why it's, it, was, it was good for me to tell a, a queer story because part of why the world seems so like dystopian at the moment, I feel like it feels like doom scrolling on our phones all the time. You know, it's just like everything's going wrong and, and we don't have any control over it. We're almost like trapped in this narrative of like everything just disintegrating. And queer people have sort of been forming alternatives for a long time, you know, like alternative family structures, alternative mm. ways of living, alternative like friendships. And the world so desperately needs alternatives, you know, to like what's been traditional up until now, because that's getting us into this mess. Mm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you, you, you delve a lot into um, these are parts of the book that I felt really old because I was like, I'm so technologically inept <laughs> that thinking about these different things um, felt exciting but also a little terrifying. <laughs> but, um, you know, one of the, the challenges of this world that we live in is this constant consumption, mm. which I think social media platforms offers, which is so dangerous because it's so debilitating and constantly thinking about these things. Yeah. And and it's very clear that that you have a kind of criticism of this and like the ways in which we could appear offline mm. for example mm. um yeah how, how do you see that kind of playing out or why was that important particularly in kind of bringing that out into the, the kind of narratives of each of the characters so th there's like a yeah, I mean, I guess anything that, that you set going into the future, I feel like you kind of do have to engage with technology because mm -hmm. certainly at the moment, like the world's obsessed with technology. And one of the things I wanted to critique was this idea that technology can save us, you know, that like Elon Musk loves peddling that, that idea that like tech, tech is going to save us, uh, which is why like a lot of sci-fi explores other planets and, you know, we just take colonialism elsewhere. We don't have to deal with our shit at home. Huh. Uh, sure. <laughs> so... Um, and I guess it, 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 it especially affects Malcolm because he ends up on the, on the sort of privileged side of, of the divide that, that Cape Town is divided into, um, which is kind of not that much of an exaggeration for current, for current Cape Town. But, but in this world, there is a citadel, which is like a climate controlled, private security uh, guarded uh, city state where the wealthy have retreated and everyone else is left in to kind of fend for themselves in the, in the slums. Um, and Malcolm's life is, I just kind of extrapolated where I see these things going, like mm. social media and things like that. It's just constant distraction because it's embedded in your, in your mind. So you can just always be streaming things. You can always be uh, engaging with people online. Uh, a lot of the people, while they travel around the Citadel, like their eyes are opaque because they're, like, they're watching things through, uh, through the lenses in their eyes. Um, and it kind of really horrifies me. Uh, so, sure, yeah. um, but I also don't want to give a simplistic view of technology. I'm not saying like we should just burn everything and like, I don't know, return to the like agrarian society or something but but i think we don't question the idea of progress enough we always just assume if it's new it's better than what came before it mm. um and i don't think that's the case like a lot of technological innovation is like leading to increased joblessness you know there's like inequalities on the rise everywhere and a lot of that's driven by technological innovation so i was trying to give a critique of that as well sure yeah and i think that's where i gained a lot of sympathy for for malcolm because i think the well the system that that's created 
when one feels so empty, it's just kind mm. of looking outward at, like, yeah. you know, whether it's, I don't know, like, sex or, mm. you know, food or, like, mm. all of these mm. things that are now just easily accessible. And yeah. And then have to, like, sit... Well, what is it we're actually feeling? Yeah. yeah, and so he's like the most connected in terms of he's always online, but he's actually totally. the most disconnected and the most lonely of the yeah. of the three characters. I yeah, think. yeah. And and he sees Lutando almost as like offering him an alternative. Mm. You know, he almost mm. wishes he could he could be there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, like cool. and Lutando does sass him a lot for being on his phone in the earlier years. <laughs> <laughs> We've all had that. <laughs> yeah. Good friends. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to leave some time for um, questions from the audience. Um, and then I have this uh, very exciting exercise of a rapid fire round for Alice. Ooh. Um, <laughs> but maybe we should take some questions first from people here. Hi. I just want to know, Alice, the process of writing a book. For me, I'm a complete perfectionist. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, I don't know, make a social media post, I don't know, <laughs> without, you know, checking in on the stuff. Yeah. How do you know when you are done? How do you let it go? Um. I don't know what the answer is in general, but I guess for me, I like eventually reached a point where I was like, I have to, <laughs> I have to let this go, or it's going to take up the rest of my life. Yeah. I don't, I don't think you ever feel like it's completely perfect. Um. Even reading it now, I mean, I, I am quite proud of it. I'm not going to lie, but I still find lines every now and then where I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have phrased that like that or whatever. So I think you've just got to step away at some point because I'm also a perfectionist and it's, and it's hard. And I think you do need to be a little bit of a perfectionist because unless you want it to be sloppy, you know, like you've got to have, you've got to, you've got to work on it until it feels like it's saying what you want it to say, which is often a really slow, torturous process. But then I guess you've just got to let go. This book was weird for me because I, I, I really struggled to write it and I, I kind of had the idea a few years ago and then I went to go do an MFA, like a Master of Fine Arts and Creative Writing and I was working, I was working on it then uh, and I, I was submitting chapters and getting feedback and it was kind of all trundling along and I guess whatever feedback I got sort of was percolating in the back of my mind because once I finished that degree I just threw everything out and started again and then it kind of just flowed. So, so I was getting feedback along the way but then it, it totally changed the project in the end. You should write a book too. <laughs> sure. Hi. Um, I'd just like to know a little bit of your story that you would be happy to share. Sure. As in, like, m my yeah. life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I grew up in Joburg. Uh, yeah, born and, born and raised in Joburg. Uh, uh, my folks got divorced when I was eight. I'm the youngest of three boys. Um, Spent two years in boarding school, which fucked me up massively, <laughs> is a theme that comes out here as well. Um, then came back to Joburg, uh, studied politics for my undergrad, and then worked in marketing. Um, I actually worked <coughs> for the DA for a year, uh, <laughs> running their social media. Um, the, 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 yeah, it's, it's experience. The scales have fallen from my eyes. Uh, <laughs> and then, yeah, I worked in a marketing consultancy for many years in Cape Town. And then, yeah, and then went over to the U.S. to do this MFA and then came back and was working on this book. Um, yeah, I guess that's my life story so far. I've always wanted to be a novelist. I've been writing my whole life. I wrote my first attempt at a novel when I was six. <laughs> so <laughs> lots of terrible poetry as a teenager. Um, yeah. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Sure, thanks. Mm. 
uh, with no prejudice, mm. you know, whatsoever, they will understand that queer relationships and people, mm. just normal people, mm. you know, and I think that, that sure. it breaks down that, that idea that we have in our head and uh, in wrong perceptions. Mm. And uh, I liked the, the fact that you brought up religion, um, the fanaticism. Um, I may be Muslim, but I don't, I, I don't deal with people that way, but I'm so glad that you brought it up. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's something that we need to focus on. And then just to commend you on the amount of research <laughs> that must Absolutely. have taken. I mean, the technology, I mean, plants, uh, <laughs> I was like, wow. I mean, like, I, I didn't even know half the stuff. <laughs> uh, for me, it felt a little bit like jargon at times. I'm like, this guy must have really done it. So, <laughs> <laughs> put this put together, so yeah. Oh, thank you so much. That's, that's really wonderful. Thanks. Um, yeah, I guess I, I, I guess I, I feel like that. We're all just human beings bumbling through life, like trying to make sense of it all around us. I think that we're kind of, it sounds a little bit like a hippie, but it, like the, 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 the central core of us is kind of the same, you know? Um, uh, and yeah, I guess the research was easier. The plant research was easier for me anyway, because I love, I love plants and they're actually quite good for my mental health. Love hanging out in forests and being surrounded by nature. So um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I go down a lot of Wikipedia rabbit holes. <laughs> But I think, um, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, because thank I think you. Particularly thinking about why writing queer stories are important because it allows us mm. an opportunity for shared humanity, mm. which is you know what we really want at the end of the day. It's the mm. same reason why we need people from all walks of life and to be able to hear their stories, to realize that we're not all that different, yeah. <laughs> irrespective of where we come from. You know. Yeah, and that's the role of the archive as well. <laughs> if I could punch nice. that. <laughs> there was another question. Oh, okay. Um, in terms of when you were actually writing the story, did you follow a schedule? Did you have like spontaneous bursts of energy? <coughs> um, so for me, I can't rely on like energy levels <laughs> or inspiration because <laughs> I'll always find something else to do. So I do try and set, uh, for me, the like, early mornings works best. So I try and set like a chunk of time every morning uh, to write. And then kind of regardless of how well it's going, I make myself stay at the desk and I don't let myself get up until I've spent three hours, whatever, um, writing. Because I think if you're waiting for inspiration, you can sometimes be waiting for a long time. And sometimes it's also like the process of starting to write and you'll maybe write a paragraph and it's rubbish, but then you delete it, but then you're kind of in the flow and then, and then the words do come. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, I'm, I'm the husband. So <laughs> 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 not a planted question. <laughs> 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 this is actually something that I was just thinking about while we got into the it's about this question about religion, which I think is really interesting because um, the book does talk a lot about about religion and and, and some of the bad impacts mm. of religion. And then mm. you almost look at nature mm. um, and the healing aspects mm. of nature, and mm. and yeah, that made me think of like almost nature as a form of religion in in and of itself. Um, do you, totally. Did, did, was that like intentional, like? Yeah, I think, well, I don't know, if it, yeah, I think it is intentional. I think it's kind of, when they're in nature, they find some of that sense of con connection to something greater than themselves that, that a lot of them are missing um, in their lives. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I certainly feel that way, like I said, when I'm in a forest or something. There's, I know the Sorry, question. Oh. Also not a planted question. <laughs> 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 hope is a big element of this as a fiction. Yes. Mm. Um, Yeah. Mm. Um, so I think there's a second question in that of like, what should we do to prevent mm. 15 years from now happening? Mm. Um, and where, where do we go for hope when, when the floods are happening in Gaza and there's a pandemic where we're mm. in mm. and where, where shall we find hope if it's not in religion, if it's mm. not in mm. or whatever else? Yeah. That's an amazing question. Thanks. Um, 
Yeah, so, like, so part of what I wanted to write the book was kind of like as a warning, you know, like this is, this is the path that we're on, like this is how it ends up, we need to think of some alternatives. And I thought I was sort of accelerating the timeline of climate chaos to, to make the point and to, and to make the descent feel so much scarier. And then the floods in case it didn't happen, just as they happen in the book. And I was like, maybe I didn't accelerate the timeline that much, you know, like things can go wrong quite quickly. Um, so I do think, I hope it gives people like a sense of urgency that we do need to change something and like wean ourselves off fossil fuels pretty much immediately. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely don't want to make the readers feel hopeless. Like there's a lot of, um, there's, a, there's a campaign that, that um, Malcolm and Lutando run together where they sort of envision alternative futures for the world um, th I earlier on in the book. Uh, so hopefully that, that can sort of spark ideas. I think, I think one of the things I was trying to hint at is that there's also hope in, in human relationships. I guess for me that was a, one of the positives of COVID is that I reprioritized the people in my life and I reconnected with some people in my life and you know had like regular, what we now have, which, which we're now trying to get out of, <laughs> but we have like a weekly Zoom with my whole family uh, <laughs> across the world. Um, so yeah, I think uh, like in community and love and, and relationships, I think that's a source of hope. And in maybe in nature, like if we sort of see how healing it can be, then maybe we'll protect it more. And also mm -hmm. it's good for our mental health, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And just touching on what your husband was speaking about, we were saying that in queer literature generally, um, the world is a dystopia, mm. kind of mm. on the fringe of it, right? And mm. then nature represents this where you can be mm. free, like Brokeback Mountain. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's God's law, mm. not the mm. country's law, right? Mm. We, so sure. we were just saying it's so interesting how you're using like a speculative fiction kind mm. of genre. Mm. Um, which, which, which kind of messes with that, which is, mm. which is normally such a, uh, a common trope in like queer literature mm. to make nature this peaceful, safe place for gay people. Yes, yeah. Sure. We were just saying, and, and then maybe you could just take this a comment or just add on to it or, or speak around it. Uh, but yeah, I thought that was just so interesting. Mm. Uh, Th and and yeah. it's so novel. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's amazing. I'd never actually thought about the fact that in like things like Brokeback Mountain, it's, it's often like a refuge refuge for, for queer people and I think it is and I guess yeah so yeah with this I'm sort of showing how fragile it is as well like it's a refuge but we it's not it's not uh, invincible and we're sort of tearing it down so <laughs> we can't lose our last refuge Andrew hi question actually one of the things that was occurring to me as we're listening now is that a lot of the explicitly antagonistic attitudes towards queer people happened sort of in the early days, so like the, uh, the timeline of, of now. Mm -hmm. And then actually one of the things that I really loved is that I didn't understand the relationship between Lutando and Kolo at, in the 15 years from now, okay. the, how they made a family, right? Mm. So I was like, there was part of me that when I read it, I was like, oh no, did he like go back in the closet? And then, uh. like I didn't understand that since <laughs> the beginning. And it was almost really cool to read and then be like, oh no, they just made a family out of friendship. And yeah. At the end, even in the midst of this dystopian like hellscape that is actually just the Cape Flats' like sandy and environment and stuff like that. And what was really interesting is that they, they I, don't, I don't think I remember an incident, in, and I don't know if it was like, and the question is, was this a conscious decision to not write in explicitly queer violence or antagonism towards queer people in this time where actually people just have a million other things to worry about? And like, is that a reflection that you think that as we move ahead, as things get so bad, that there people will realize that there are in fact way more important things to be focused <laughs> sure. on than just like yeah. other people and how they're living their life? Yeah. Um, wow. Thanks. Um, I don't. I don't know if that. I don't, yeah, I have to be honest. I don't know if that was a, like a conscious decision. I think there's quite a lot of violence in the VWA storyline, which is sort of, I guess, halfway along the book. So I, yeah. I, I didn't want to kind of dwell too much in that because th there's some pretty grim things that happen in that in that storyline but I love that idea that people will finally let go of, <laughs> of like hatred and judgment because it's not it's not helpful no. yeah no no thanks <laughs> yeah I, uh, so with your I just wanted to know because I'm also I want to write one day and I've been practicing but I think procrastinating now so mm -hmm. I'm with your writing 
you do procrastinate for like a long time and then while you're procrastinating inspiration comes in oh and then you go back and then you procrastinate again <laughs> yeah um, I mean I, I really also struggle with procrastination which is why I was I was saying like I have to I have to be really systematized about it because I I'll never I'll never write if I'm if I just think oh, I'll do it when I'm feeling inspired or already or whatever it is which is why I'm like regimented I'm like set my alarm for like five or six a.m. and I'm gonna write for three hours and I'm not gonna leave my desk and I like turn off my phone and do all the things so that I can't be distracted um, yeah, but 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 then if you are feeling really stuck, I guess, and no ideas are coming, then it's, it is nice to get out of the house and like go for a run or whatever it is, and then sometimes ideas do come. But I don't know if they come when I'm just like watching Netflix or whatever. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cool. <laughs> yes. Hey. Um, okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And, and yeah, and like, please don't just buy my book. Please buy like books by people of color all the time. You know. Yeah. <laughs> One more question, and I think you. Okay, sure. Last question. Now, as as a follow up to the comments, mm -hmm. um, while you were writing, did you have any people that you looked up to? What were your literary influences? Hmm. Good question. <laughs> uh, my literary influences. Um, I love Casey Lodeka. I love uh, his work. Uh, also very bleak, <laughs> but um, Nakane wrote a great book, Nakane Tori, um, which also documents like queer life in the Eastern Cape. Um, and then I suppose uh, in the more dystopian realm, like people like Margaret Atwood writes like amazing dystopia. Uh, Masande Nchanga wrote an amazing um, speculative fiction book uh, set in South Africa called Triangulum, which is brilliant. Um, Richard Powers does amazing uh, nature writing. So mm. the guy who wrote uh, Bewilderment and The Overstory, that's kind of where my love of trees got even more obsessive. Sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. Great. Um, those were all really great questions. Yeah, they were. Thank you, everyone. So, yeah, <laughs> what, a, what an amazing kind of conversation and just like has given me a lot more to think about the book. Yeah. So I wanted to end off with this um, rapid fire round, which are <laughs> very silly questions. And as I was looking at them, I was like, oh my God, are these like terrible? <laughs> but we're amongst friends. So <laughs> there's no right or wrong answer. Okay. <laughs> but you can <laughs> accept. Yes, accept. Um, and we're going to go quickly so you don't have much time to think about this. Ooh, okay. That's my worst, but okay. Yes, <laughs> yes exactly. Number one, who is Lutandu's favorite diva? Is it Mariah? Brenda Fassi or Beyonce? Beyonce. <laughs> Thought as much. Um, favorite sex scene in the novel? Um, God, they were all quite fun to write, I have to say. <laughs> um, They're fun to read. Yeah. I think maybe the one that I read, because it's kind of so absurd, because it's mm. also like a dreamscape, so you can just really have fun with it and roll with it. Yeah. And it ends in a forest, which is And it ends great. in a forest, yeah. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Malcolm's grinder profile. What are his tribes? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Daddy. <laughs> Ginger. <laughs> um, Checks out. Yeah, Checks yeah, out. Yeah. If there was to be a Netflix series, mm. who would play Napolo? Paul Tusi, Zoe Kravitz, or Lupita Nyongo? Oh, Lupita Nyongo. Yay! <laughs> I thought so through. <laughs> now, this one, there is a right or wrong answer. Oh, God, okay. In a rugby match, <laughs> what position does v -Way play? I don't even know <laughs> rugby positions. Right, I'm sorry. We don't play. Amazing. <laughs> So once again, thank you so much to everyone for coming and enjoying this. Um, I just wanted to say that um, as part of the Gala Queer Archive, we often publish works um, particularly based on queer and African narratives. 
and the two publications that are available here. The one is Utros Corpus Gnosis, Other Bodies of Ours, which is an uh, amazing photographic and also oral history project of queer life in Mozambique. And then Meanwhile, which is a graphic short stories about everyday queer life in Southern and East Africa. And both of these books are available to you for free. So if you want, please do grab a copy. And once again, please support African writers, please support African queer stories, um, and make sure that you go out and buy this book Thank you, Alistair. So Thank you, Kevin. Cool. That was wonderful. Yeah. And thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs> Alistair will be signing books, so yeah, uh, just shortly after this. But thanks, everyone. Enjoy your session. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, friend. Bye.